Hello guys, I'm Andre Miselin. This is AC's I'm mean, with Lars Froland. He's a lecturer at MIT. Lars, welcome. Thank it's you a so pleasure. much to have you here. It's a pleasure to be in Rio. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Lars, uh, I'd like to start uh, with your background and uh, hear about your relationship with, with MIT, uh, about your classes. So let's start from the beginning. So uh, I have a sort of a long-standing relationship with MIT. I'm currently a lecturer at MIT at something called Global Programs. And within Global Programs, we have a, a very uh, great program called REAP, the Regional Entrepreneurship Actuation Program. So I'm part of, uh, of, of that program and I'm part of Global Programs right now at MIT. This belongs to the Sloan School of Management at MIT. Before that, I was a uh, research director at the MIT Simulation Initiative and also a visiting fellow uh, at MIT. Cool. And uh, we have, uh, we were talking before the, the interview uh, began uh, about the three principles for yeah. achieving missions. Uh, yeah, yeah I think, no, I think, I think if you look back at like overarching what I've been looking into in this whole world of innovation, I think my my field of expertise lies at sort of if you sort of imagine a Venn diagram in front of you and you sort of said in the middle of that Venn diagram, um, it's really about innovation, uh, it's about emerging technologies and how you bring emerging technologies to the market and the geopolitical situation. So I'm really sort of my field of expertise lies in the area where you say, well, we have an emerging technology that could be, you know, AI. AI is not as much emerging as it is, you know, ten years ago. But let's take another one: quantum, quantum technology. Uh, that where you sort of want to try to bring that uh, to impact into the world. Uh, but at the same time, there is a geopolitical situation around that, which relates to uh, state sovereignty, which relates to technological sovereignty, and and how sort of the whole how states interact within technological development. So that's been my field for, 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 for many years now. And I think one of the key lessons that I wanted to talk to you about is to say, well, like the world is now standing in front of, of, of some enormous challenges. And, you know, I really appreciate being here in Rio. And as many other countries, this country is also touched by you know, climate change. So I think one of the key missions that we have in front of us right now is then how do we achieve in the best way the green transition? Um, and one of the key things that I've been working on for the last years is really to work with governments, and large corporations, and other universities around the world in figuring out, you know, how can we, how can we bring deep tech technologies to the market that eventually will deliver solutions that will, you know, deliver us to green, a greener future in that sense. And when you look into that, one of the key things that I that I keep you know yelling at you know uh, governments at is that we really need to fundamentally change the way that we fund research. We need to fundamentally change the way that risk capital is engaging with startups coming out of universities. So let me just look, talk a little bit about that because, in a way, let me. I don't want to be too lengthy about this, but if you. Fundamentally, if you look into the funding system of the world, how we fund research, how we fund innovation, how we do risk capital, sort of started in a way after the aftermath of the Second World War with uh, Vannevar Bush's uh, The Endless Frontier and the separation of you know, applied research and basic research. And we've sort of created a system that is uh, very much focused on the research part and bringing the research to the world and not very focused on at the end of the day some of the challenges that we have uh, in the world and then sort of working with the research to actually in the end create some of the solutions. Uh, so there is a lack of in the world today of what I call use inspired basic research. Um, and I think one one example of an organization that I always bring, I always talk about that is fundamentally very focused on this. Uh, and some of the key, three key principles that they work on uh, is the U.S. Uh, the organization called DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency. And I think it's important to, to focus on this specific, what we can call the DARPA model for how you bring deep tech to the market, targeted 
uh, those societal challenges and thus, you know, in the end, achieving this mission of the real transition. Uh, one of the key, key things that we can learn from DARPA is uh, a systematic ability to what I call to appreciate the heretical ideas. I think if we are to uh, fundamentally develop new solutions, we need to, you know, have in a systematic way be able to appreciate heretical ideas. Um, DARPA is known for being the first inventors or the first sponsors of some of the research that went into what eventually led to GPS, the internet, to drones, and already in 2013 was the agency that was able to fund uh, research going into mRNA and made some of the earliest investments into two very important companies, Moderna and CureVac. CureVac is the, is the German company. And I think it just reminds us that we were able to achieve the mission of a vaccine for COVID. And I think we were only able to do so because already in 2013, there was a funding body that was able to actually appreciate a heretical idea about mRNA. And at the time in 2013, it was really science fictional. People were saying, no, this can't be done. This is impossible. And I think what we're lacking a little bit in the world right now, to be very frank, is there's not enough uh, funding agencies, there's not enough risk capital that is actually risk capital, that is actually high risk capital. We've become somewhat complacent with all of the ideas that are already there, and we've suddenly forgotten that the fundamental you know, success of many funding agencies, but also risk capital, is to actually do high risk, high reward investments at the time, which then further down the line are then ready when we actually need them, right? We were lucky that DARPA did those investments in 2013, otherwise we could not develop an mRNA vaccine in a hundred days. Sure. And how re replicable do you think this model, uh, the DARPA model, is for a country like Brazil? It's, it's, it's replicable for, for any country in the world, and we've seen a, a lot of countries uh, trying, I would say, to, to replicate the DARPA model, both in, in, in Europe, European Innovation Council that I've been part of setting up uh, in Germany with so, uh, an organization called Spindle. The UK have just launched their area program. I think fundamentally, if I can go back to those three principles, I think if Brazil were to do this as well, I think there's three things that you need to get right uh, about the DARPA model that is sometimes talked about, but it's also maybe the hardest ones to actually uh, achieve. Uh, the first principle is uh, DARPA is really an organization that uh, has an enormous amount of freedom to operate. It is given a, a yearly budget, but within that, they have complete uh, freedom to use that budget for whatever they want to use that budget for. So there is, in this organization, there is a notion of what I call um, deliberate opacity. That means that you actually have an organization that is opaque, right? that makes decisions about what to fund, and sometimes when the, uh, the rest of the world or the rest of the country is saying, oh, you shouldn't fund this, this doesn't work, and so forth, they actually say, well, then we should do it. As is true with a lot of things within innovation, if everybody thinks that you have a good idea, it's because you have a bad idea. Right? Your idea simply doesn't have the right level of ambition. Right? So you fundamentally you need to have that. So you need to use the metaphor of, of Steve Jobs, you need to have a pirate ship as part of the movie. So my question maybe to Brazil is that, do we have a pirate ship? Or do we have a pirate ship that's also part of the marine? So the point is that the US government, when it was created DARPA, knew that they needed to create a new entity that was able to make those bold investments. And that was not, you know, that, and at the same time could move outside of new long committee meetings, too many compromises, not too much political steering. So that's some of the political sort of you know, the freedom to operate lies at that sort of deliberate opacity. They have the freedom to make these crazy investments into what is seemingly science fiction, but seemingly impossible. Because at the end of the day, any mission, you know, the directionality of an achieved mission is moving from the science fictional, the impossible, to the possible, and then to the inevitable. And I think that's the first principle, right? The deliberate uh, sort of opacity. The second principle is, is, is also quite interesting, is to be really believe in idiosyncrasy. Uh, the freedom to have idiosyncrasy. 
So in the DARPA model is that the program managers of DARPA have a lot of freedom to make personal decisions on whether to fund something or not. Right? They don't have to go to do, do through lengthy peer review processes. By the way, peer review is also one of the other sort of legacies that we have since the Second World War. So a lot of funding agencies, a lot of things today when you fund novel ideas, go through a peer review process. The problem is that peer review is a, is a, a conservative process. What it does is that it acknowledges ideas that lie within the current paradigm of what is seen as possible. So in a way, you're not creating something new. It's an innovation agency that actually is relying too much on, on peer review and not personal discretion at the end of the day have taken away its own ability to actually do innovation because it's lying within what is already accepted as being okay to find. The latter part is then to really focus on not only things that work, but things that really matter. So the one way to talk about this is re reusing a story and a metaphor that's been taken up by Ash Rotella, who's the CEO of, of Google X. Google X, by the way, is one of the American DARPA-like organizations built you know, on, on the DARPA model. And, and what he says, he tells his story is, um, if you were to put a monkey reading Shakespeare, if you were to build a pedestal, and on that pedestal, put a monkey reading Shakespeare. How would you go about it? And in most organizations, what they'll go about it is start building the pedestal, right? You build the pedestal, it's quickly done, it's a quick KPI, you, you know, build it in 100 colors, and you tell your boss, here's the pedestal, here's 100 different colors, isn't it wonderful, give me a bonus. The point is, of course, that the whole key part of this whole thing is to actually get the monkey to read Shakespeare. So I think there is, uh, from DARPA, there is a, a, an enormous focus on within a problematic field to say, let's not focus on what works, but on what actually matters. You, know, you can get a pedestal to work, but what actually matters at the end of the day is the monkey reading Shakespeare. So, you know, just for many organizations, maybe when you have your team meeting, it's a good question to always ask, you know, are we building pedestals here? Are we actually focusing on getting the monkey to read Shakespeare? And I think having that level of ambition is just incredible. So the way to translate this into a little bit more concrete terms is that DARPA worked with programs where they try to target what could be the monkey reading Shakespeare. The program that led to the creation of GPS was the following. Let's build a handheld device with military P code of less than 10 pounds. A handheld device with military Pico was the pedestal. Of less than 10 pounds in the late 60s was a monkey reading chip. That was the program that started miniaturization that eventually led that we have GPS in these rooms. Because that was the monkey reading chip. That was the hard thing to achieve. So can Brazil do this? Yes, but they need to work on these principles and say, can we create an entity within our own system that is kind of that pirate ship, that is outside of the current ways that we're doing things? Because if we only have that, if we have that, then we can actually start funding things that are seemingly right now science fictional, but in five years or 10 years, will be the new technology that actually will save us, you know, a greener future. Yeah, yeah, very, very, very good. Uh, one last question, uh, how, how can you keep your pragmatism and and choose these science fictional projects uh, you have and between them among them for sure you will have some ideas that will not flourish mm -hmm. uh, some of them uh, will be uh, you know uh, ideas that will change the world uh, and some of them will die uh, how can you select them and how do you uh, spread investments between them? Um, so what you normally do is that you give a program a runtime, let's say three years or four years or five years. So, you, so what, you do, what, what that does is that it enables you to say that within that time frame, we can actually make actual progress within an area. What you also need to be very, very cautious about is that you have uh, a density of potential solution providers within a specific challenge that you can work with. 
so that you can actually select out of a critical mass of people to work in a particular area. So you can actually get very complete results. If you don't have a very discrete description of what you're trying to achieve, then you end up funding more basic research, which is fine, but it's not going to be used in spy basic research. You're actually not focusing on something that's discrete enough, or narrow enough in this problem that you can actually measure progress. So that's the way you sort of work on the pragmatism, because you might have a three-year program that will get you closer to getting the monkey to reach Shakespeare, and you can measure that progress, but you won't get there. But that's not a problem, because you're still making progress, and then you have another program, and then you get there. The whole point is to start by saying what the monkey reading Shakespeare is, and then you can measure the progress. Having that level of ambition from the beginning, and then moving pragmatically toward that with very critical milestones. But you have uh, you, you you have to be ready for, for losing money in some of these projects, right? Yes. Some of them, uh, yeah. for sure, will not achieve the, the objectives. Exactly, and that's the whole point. Right. There yeah. is a, the whole point of innovation yeah, is that a lot of a lot of projects will fail, yes. and you need to allow for that. And I think we have probably I think the time is right now to actually move forward with actually doing more high risk, potentially high reward innovation, because what we're currently seeing is that all over the world is that a lot of funding agencies have moved into a world of conservatism, yeah. funding what or you know funding more of what already is, doing optimization, what already is of existing technologies. And you have actually, by the way, also seen a risk capital scene that seems to have forgotten completely deep tech and some of those solutions that lie within the green area. Yeah. You know, uh, risk capital scene, you know, used to be a very adventurous business. There's, you know, the last 20 years what risk capital has been able to do is take a lot of the adventurous out of risk capital. Right. It's not very risky any longer because they have started focusing predominantly on two things. Software as a service and drug discovery and biotech. Drug discovery and biotech is obviously very risky, but the financial and the, but the risk capital market is so well developed that your exit is so you know, very well defined that it's actually less risky to be there. On the software as a service, you, know, you can de-risk something very, very quickly for very little money. Yeah. A lot of the technologies that lies between software as a service and drug discovery and biotech is what we call deep tech. And a lot of those deep tech uh, companies are finding a very, very hard time, maybe in Brazil, but I know in the US and also in Europe, it's very, very hard for them to actually find investors that have that type of patient capital to invest uh, into these type of, uh, of companies because they need more money, they are often hardware-based. Most risk capital today hate something that is hardware. No, 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 hardware, that means we need to produce it. It's awful, let's not fund it, right? Let's not invest into that. But at the end of the day, what we've seen now, also, let me just say with the Ukrainian war, is that we are, at the end of the day, very dependent on our critical infrastructure, which is very hardware-based. It's hardware. So we need to start understanding that we need to, to you know, to, to have a greener future, we need to actually start investing much more in deep tech uh, and create alternative uh, funds and venture capital organizations that can then actually, you know, invest in, in, in those areas. And that's obviously also what's happening right now, because we sort of acknowledge that, you know, uh, a, greener, a greener future simply doesn't happen with software as a service. Yeah, Lars, thank you so much. Uh, it was a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. Uh, I was uh, with Lars Froland. Guys, stay with us for more at MIT Technology Review Brazil. Lars, again, thank you. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you.